security administration. I want to congratulate the security administration and management uh, department of the um, of the college for putting on this important webinar. The program dean, Miss Archer, and the chief cook and bottle washer for conceptualizing and arranging this this activity. Um, the very competent Mr. Dennis Brown. For us, we see security and citizen security as critical for our overriding mission and purpose at the college, which is to promote uh, social justice and, and greater social equity for all citizens. We recognize that unless people feel safe in their homes and in their countries, that they will not have a sense of well-being and a sense of confidence um, <clears throat> and will not be able to go about their daily business in a way that can contribute to the holistic development of our societies. So having said that, I want to welcome you to the webinar. And again, I want to congratulate uh, Ms. Archer and Mr. Brown, and I want to wish you good deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. On that note, I will also want to issue a profound apology um, for the late start, um, but be assured that the hiccups um, experience were not exclusively that of the operational features of our IT department. Without further ado, I would want to go straight into the program and issue an invitation to Dr. Wendell Wallace to address us. And Dr. Wallace is a criminologist who lectures in criminology and criminal justice at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. He's also a qualified attorney at law in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as in England and Wales and a practicing mediator with the Med Mediation Board of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Wallace will be exploring with us and enlightening us on the topic, challenges facing rehabilitation in our nation's prisons. Without any further ado, I hand the proceedings over to Dr. Wallace. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, good afternoon to the listening and viewing audience. And for me, it's a pleasure to be here um, at the BHS of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. So thank you for the invitation as well. Uh, let me just um, put the, my presentation on slideshow mode. Right. So good afternoon again. And this afternoon, I'll be exploring challenges facing rehabilitation in our nation's prisons in Trinidad and Tobago. But first, I want to start by having you look at this pictorial, and I want you to keep this in mind. This is an individual who has been incarcerated, who has been placed um, in a bubble in their own space, and that bubble represents the prison. But I want you to keep this in mind so that when we get to the end of the presentation, you'll be able to have a better appreciation of some of the things that I am about to speak on today. So first and foremost, in academe, I want to share these two key tenets. First and foremost, people go to prison as punishment and not for punishment. And by that, I mean, that individuals are sent to prison because they have breached some law or laws and they are sent to prison as punishment. They are not sent there to be punished, meaning that the prison conditions should be of a particular standard. And that standard is that the prisons should be humane for all of us. Keep in mind that any one of you in the, in, in the viewing audience, in the listening audience can end up in a prison as a prisoner or as a remandee, and that you would want those conditions to be as humane as possible. 
In addition to that, we must keep in mind that the main goal of the prison, the main goal is to rehabilitate those individuals who have been so incarcerated. Now remember this, the individuals who are incarcerated, unless they die within the prison system of old age, unless they die, they must be released at some point in time and what happens is that they will return to us in our communities. And that, that, that ties in to the previous tenet that people go there, people go to prison as punishment and not basically for punishment. So what is rehabilitation? In your readings, you may come across numerous definitions uh, of rehabilitation. But there are three basic conceptions that you will always see. When we speak of rehabilitation, we are basically looking at one. Rehabilitation refers to the means. What do we use to achieve that intended end? Rehabilitation also looks at the aim or the end of rehabilitation. In other words, what's that the, the outcome? So rehabilitation can refer to the outcome as well. And in some instances, you will see rehabilitation being referred to as a combination of ends and means. Now, in my presentation, when I speak about rehabilitation, rehabilitation is conceptualized in this presentation as interventions, the use of interventions that are aimed at correcting those personality traits, those behaviors, those attitudes of the incarcerated individuals. And that aim is to ensure that they are aligned with those established societal norms that we hold dear and that we value. But importantly, rehabilitation is a process. Rehabilitation is also an outcome. So it's not a process by itself. If we were to see rehabilitation as a process, then we'll miss the mark. If we were to see rehabilitation as an outcome only, then we have also missed the mark. So rehabilitation is both a process and an outcome. And Hoskin says, you want to improve the skills capacity as well as the opportunities for these in incarcerated individuals. But as I said earlier, unless these incarcerated individuals die within the prison system, then they must be returned to us. And therefore, the aim of rehabilitation, another aim, is to return offenders to, our, to their social milieus as contributing, law-abiding, productive citizens. And that's the basic conceptualization. These are some of the basic tenets of um, rehabilitation. Within Trinidad and Tobago, within the Trinidad and Tobago Prison Service, there are numerous rehabilitation uh, programs. However, these programs vary. They vary according to the type of offense. They vary according to the offender and according to the needs of the offender or the perceived needs of the offender after the offender has been assessed. Additionally, these programs that are afforded to incarcerated inmates, they are also afforded based on the prison location. Unfortunately, not all of the rehabilitation programs within the Trinidad and Tobago Prison Service are afforded to all of the inmates. So broadly speaking, some of the rehabilitation programs that you find within the Trinidad and Tobago Prison Service, they are subsumed under these four headings. Alcohol and substance abuse treatment, you have psychological or behavioral uh, interventions, you have vocational training and you have educational training programs. So as I said, the, the, the programs that you have, they will fall um, under some of these uh, four headings. Do we have challenges in terms of rehabilitating the inmates in Trinidad and Tobago? If I might say so myself, yes, they are challenges. And some of the challenges that we face, uh, and I'll start with a limited the limitedness of oversight facilities. For example, within the Trinidad and Tobago Prison Service, we have what is known as an inspector of prisons. And the inspector of prisons 
um, has that responsibility to be the voice of these inmates. Unfortunately, the last inspector of prison report that was written was written in 2013 under the then inspector of prison, Daniel Kahn. I think it's either 2012 or 2013. And what the inspector of prison, what that report does is that it highlights uh, what's happening in the prisons, uh, the good things, the not so good things, the intention, where are we going in terms of prison and prison rehabilitation. Other challenges to inmate rehabilitation in Trinidad and Tobago um, would be, for example, uh, weak aftercare programs. And as a result of these weak aftercare programs, you have, for example, the inmates, when they demit the, the, the prisons in Trinidad and Tobago, you have a chronic lack of jobs, lack of housing, in fact, some of the inmates, they return to the same social milieus, they return, they return to the same communities. And no matter how good you, your rehabilitation program is, if these inmates do not have a good aftercare program, when they return to the social, to, to their communities within a short space of time, those forces within the society can conspire to have them go along a, um, a different route and not fulfill their rehabilitative programs. Within the prison system, you have um, a chronic overcrowding. And the data um, in 2022 shows that at least two thirds of our inmates in the Trinidad and Tobago prison service, uh, in, in the prison service, that they were, were remandees and not incarcerated individuals. And that in itself uh, poses a problem. What happens is that in the context of overcrowding, when you have the overcrowding within the system, that doesn't augur well for rehabilitation. Um, to proceed with some of the other challenges, and mind you, these are just some of the challenges, right? These are, I'm trying to fit this into 15 minutes. The prison conditions are really poor and it's, it impacts the prison officers. And when the prison officers who are supposed to act as that vessel to rehabilitate inmates, when you have poor terms and poor conditions, then they are demotivated. And that in itself feeds into the limited capacity of some prison officers uh, to rehabilitate offenders. Indeed, some of the prison officers are not well trained. However, I'm seeing that move towards having prison officers trained not only in criminology and criminal justice, but in psychology, in social work in mediation, in a whole host of rehabilitative programs. One of the key challenges that the inmates face um, or that the prison service face is that inmates also have there's the availability of drugs within the prison system. And if we are trying to rehabilitate individuals and wean them off drugs, wean them off substance abuse, then it makes no sense to have uh, drugs being available to them. It's counterproductive, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the scope of the rehabilitation program, it's limited based on location. So some of the programs that may be available to inmates at the Golden Grove Prison, for example, it's not available at um, Carrera Island Prison. And that in itself um, is a challenge. Most importantly, in my estimation, the lack of state funding for rehabilitation programs, that is to me one of the major challenges. Indeed, in academia, you will hear, or there's a saying that prisoners do not win elections. And globally, governments have this challenge. They are challenged as well. Where do we put our limited resources? Do we put our resources into the prisons or do we put it into the educational system? Do we put it into the, the, the ensuring the, the, the safety, the well-being, the welfare of those persons who are uh, not within the prison system? So that there's just this conundrum, where do we place our limited resources based on the fact that prisoners do not win elections? So just to wrap up my presentation and to keep in line with the dictates of, of the chair, uh, Mr. Brown, whilst we must identify um, challenges, whilst we must identify um, problems, in criminology, we are, we are very big, we are keen on putting forth solutions. So it's not good enough to just identify the problems that we have, but it's also important to proffer some solutions and some recommendations. But this afternoon, my recommendations are not very expansive due to, to, to the need for brevity in the context of time. And therefore, 
to conclude um, my presentation, I'm simply saying, if we are to rehabilitate these incarcerated individuals, if we are to rehabilitate them and return them to society as productive, uh, law-abiding, contributing societies, then we must look at those challenges that I identified previously. And we must not only look at the challenges, but we must also seek ways of overcoming these challenges. So let's have an inspector of prisons report conducted and written, authored in a timely manner. Let's look at inmates as, as human and let's treat them in a humane manner. All right, these are just some of my recommendations. And I asked you to look at the inmate. In my opening, I asked you to look at the inmate. So this representation of the inmates, right? In his bubble. If we do not rehabilitate, if we fail to rehabilitate these individuals, their mindset, their cognitive abilities, their vocational skills will remain trapped within that bubble of prisonization. And if we do not uh, if we do not rehabilitate them, it, and rehabilitation feeds into reintegration. If we fail to rehabilitate, then re, um, reintegration will become a pipe dream. And what happens is that that pipe dream will impact all of us in a negative manner, in that the failure to rehabilitate feeds into um, reintegration, and these inmates, they remain trapped, they remain prisonized, and that, con that, that leads to the continuation, right? That leads to the continuation of prison behavior. It leads to the continuation of crime, criminality, and deviance. So indeed, uh, my plea here this afternoon is not only to identify uh, the challenges facing uh, the, the, the prison system, but to make a plug so that these inmates can be rehabilitated. And as with any good um, academic presentation, I, I have several readings. I have three readings here that may be useful uh, to the audience. And you know, this is my, re my, my contact information if needed. So at this point in time, I want to thank you for being a good audience and to hand you back to Mr. Dennis Brown, the chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallace. I have to assign to you a new designation and that designation is a precisionist when it comes to time management. Let me just uh, inform the participants uh, that they are free to ask their questions by typing it in the chat box. Right. Um, Dr. Wallace, we do have one question here, and the first question is, I saw recently there was an article in the newspaper with regard to the NGOs who were questioning the restart of the rehabilitation programs. Is it that these programs have not yet been fully operational? Okay, um, so to answer that question, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question, um, rehabilitation doesn't stop. Rehabilitation should not have stopped so that when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, there are certain restrictions that were placed um, on external bodies, um, and for example, the NGOs from entering the prison. Of course, we all know what that entailed. Uh, but rehabilitation is not only external. Rehabilitation has internal and external components. So the internal components, um, they were working. Uh, the efficiency or efficacy, that's up to the prison service to determine, but they were continuing. Um, to the best of my knowledge, some of the external programs were functioning under particular constraints. So um, the NGOs were allowed, but there were particular restrictions. Now that we have um, fully reopened and the pandemic, um, now the pandemic may not be over, but the pandemic restrictions, they have been lifted. Um, it is my understanding that the um, NGOs are free, and I know, for example, the Iron Dependency, for example, um, some of those programs, they have actually restarted. Uh, so, so that's the best that I can proffer at this point in time. I'm really hopeful that the rehabilitation programs, the external ones, that they have actually restarted and that they are fully functional. 
In fact, um, I've seen, for example, I know, for example, the agricultural program, which is part of the, um, the, 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 um, the internal rehabilitation program, I've seen it and I know that that in itself, that has restarted and it's fully functional. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the other question um, that has been placed for your attention, Dr. Wallace, is do you believe that programs facilitated by the NGOs are having an impact on the outcome of inmates' ability to reintegrate? Um, again, that's another very good question. And sometimes what happens is that because the prison system is very, very much closed, sometimes uh, persons on the outside of that system or, do, or persons who are not privy to the workings of the rehabilitation programs within the prison system, sometimes they have the view that, you know, that rehabilitation, um, it's non-functional and it's non-impactful. From where I stand, I am a firm believer that rehabilitation and attempts to rehabilitate these inmates that it works. If you look at the recidivism rate throughout the Caribbean, it's approximately 60 to 65 percent. And that means that for every 100 inmates uh, who goes to the prison, approximately 60 to 65 percent um, return. And that means that approximately 30 to 40 do not return. And all things being equal, it could mean that either uh, it, it can mean that they are rehabilitated and they have not returned to the prison system. My view is that if, if we were to even save one person from returning to the prison system, then that's one person that we should congratulate. Indeed, I am aware that several rehabilitative programs that they are functional. Um, you know, I must make a plug, for example, um, Anointed Sons International, um, which doesn't necessarily, uh, Anointed Sons doesn't work with prisoners per se. I know they work with the, the lads and lasses, the, the, the juveniles. And, and that's um, run by, by one of your personnel at, at, at the college. And I can safely say that I have seen many youths who have attended that program and who have returned to the, 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 the society and they have changed their, their, their ways and they're non-criminogenic at this point in time. So to answer the question, yes, I do believe in rehabilitation. I do believe that the NGOs are impactful and they are making insightful um, inroads in terms of rehabilitation. But please understand that not all of the individuals who would have gone through the prison system are, uh, you know, are actually rehabilitated and do not uh, return to the system. Okay, the other question please for your attention is, in your opinion, do you believe that the inspector's report reflects complete honesty of prison conditions? Well, I, I am hoping, I am very hopeful that, that the inspector of prisons report that, that it's an honest reflection of um, the prison conditions. In fact, that's part of the remit of the inspector of prisons to provide an honest, truthful, and transparent overview of the happenings of the workings of the prison system. I would hate to think that the inspector of prisons report um, is misleading and uh, or serves to mislead us and to mislead any government um, as to the, the, the workings of the prison system. So to answer that, it is supposed to be, that is what it's supposed to do. The Inspector of Prison Report is supposed to be an honest, truthful and transparent report as to the workings of the prison system. Okay. Uh, the other um, areas of concern uh, revolves around this question here, which is please for your attention. Has your information been shared with the prison service and what was the response? Right, uh, Mr. Brown, you know, very good question to the audience. Uh, that's a very good question as well. And, you know, at the risk of sounding self-opinionated and, uh, uh, and rude, et cetera, I want to share an experience with you. There's an article that I wrote on virtual visitation. I conducted that research somewhere in 2015. And between 2015 to 2019, 
have presented that uh, at several conferences in Trinidad and Tobago within the Caribbean. And I was met with consternation uh, and a whole host of uh, attempts to shame my research. People were saying that virtual visitation is a pipe dream and I'm too um, I, um, idealistic. Basically, virtual visitation looks at allowing inmates to visit using a virtual platform. It was written off. Fortunately, it got published in, in um, an international, in a book. That article has been shared by Mr. Burton Hill, a prison welfare officer. It had been shared with former ministers of national security, former prison commissioners, et cetera. And you know what, Mr. Brown? It had been written off. Nobody cared to think about it. And then what happened? COVID-19 happened. And then what did we have to do? We had to revert or we had to go looking for a system to allow people to visit using virtual platforms. So with that, I rest my case and I hope I answer the question that has been asked uh, in the chat. Uh, the final question placed here for your attention, um, Dr. Wallace, is are there any other facilities to manage the exit of prisoners apart from vision and mission? Well, the prison service, I know that they have um, an aftercare program. Um, well, they, they facilitate and they manage the aftercare uh, you know, of those individuals who are leaving. I know vision on a mission, vision on mission, they have been doing uh, very well. Um, to, to name anything um, at this point in time, would be rather challenging uh, based on the question that was asked before, you know, related to the NGOs that, um, that and the rehabilitation programs that have restarted slash soon to be restarted. But I know that there, um, you have, um, there's a program managed by an ex-inmate, I think it's Colin Rosales. Um, but to put my finger on, on the names at this point in time is a bit difficult, but I know that they are, they are one or two, um, maybe not on the scale of um, vision and mission. Um, and just to make a plug here again, uh, Mr. Brown, at this point in time, the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine and my good self, we are working on a program um, called the Befriender Program, right? Befriender Visitation Program. So uh, to the person who asked about that, maybe in about three months time, you can look out for that program, which aims to also manage um, inmates and to, 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 to seek to reintegrate them fully into the society after their incarceration period has ended. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wallace. I just want to quickly underscore, emphasize the point which you made at the commencement of your presentation. And I think we should all wrap our attention around this declaration, which is you go to prison, not for punishment, but as punishment. And I am fully aware of your exceptionally busy um, schedule. So, I would want to, on behalf of the college, register our sincere appreciation for your informational, some people may use the term eruditional input. At this point in time, we- Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. Thank you so much to Cipriani, to the college. And um, it's a pleasure being here and sharing. So thanks to the audience as well. Um, as I take my leave, I just want to express my deepest gratitude to the entire college. Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. Okay. And let me also end by saying, um, Dr. Wallace, I see clearly that you are keeping fit. Um, <laughs> and I will say no more on that. Um, <laughs> we now move to another critical area of concern within the context of this webinar exercise. And this has to do with the whole question of crime suppression. And it is in keeping with this exploration, I take great pleasure in welcoming Mr. McDonald Jacob, who um, was a recent past holder of the post of Acting Commissioner of Police. Mr. McDonald Jacob has attained his Master's of Philosophy degree 
in criminology and criminal justice from the University of the West Indies. And his study was based on the utilization on information technology and artificial intelligence in crime fighting. Mr. Jacob also possessed an LLB, which is a law degree from the University of London. And a post, he also holds a postgraduate diploma in mediation studies from the University of the West Indies. And it is against this background, I take tremendous pleasure in calling <clears throat> to the program, Mr. Jacob, to enlighten us within the context of crime suppression and mediation in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Mr. Jacob. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Brown. And again, I um, enjoyed the presentation by Mr. Wendell um, Wallace. I'm happy to see that we are focusing in that crucial area. Uh, I'm happy to be a participant and uh, presenter in this, this program this afternoon. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. The whole aspect of achieving crime reduction in a heightened criminogenic environment is a serious issue that face Trinidad and Tobago today. And the topic that I was given to discuss today is in relation to crime suppression and mediation. And you know, it is very unique to see that I'm given such a thing, crime suppression and mediation, which in some person's mind is like, chalk and cheese, you know, when you look at what is really crime suppression and what is really mediation. What I will do this evening is to show how crime suppression and mediation can in fact work hand in hand to assist in dealing with crime reduction and especially in Trinidad and Tobago. When we look at the term crime suppression, it comes out of the criminology term when we talk about crime control, which basically is divided up into two aspects, is divided up into crime prevention and crime detection. The word suppression basically comes out of crime control. It is really a more aggressive and active measure used by law enforcement to ensure the safety and security of a community. And the easiest way for us to appreciate and understand it is to think whether or not crime suppression is used as a mechanism in Trinidad and Tobago to help with the crime situation. In some person's mind, crime suppression is not necessarily proactive policing, but reactive, because you are reacting to a situation that may have occurred in a community, and you are looking to suppress things from continuing or happening again. It involves a lot of activities, such as stop and search. It has where you will lock down the area, looking at the exit, the egress, and the entry of a community, and you plan your strategies around that. It is actually to suppress, to impede, to contain, to control, to manage a particular area. The example for any student to understand when we talk about crime suppression is to think about our interagency task force in Trinidad and Tobago. I tend to use a lot of our local examples because there is a direct tendency to believe that Trinidad and Tobago and our law enforcement over a period have not introduced anything at all that is significant to reduce crime. However, in 2006, 2007, 
What we had in Trinidad and Tobago was the highest escalation in violent crime that we have seen. You know, as students of criminology, criminal justice and research, we know what percentage is. So you just don't look at the numbers. And if I say that was the largest increase, that is the period when Trinidad and Tobago moved from having an average of 300 murders per year to reaching 500 and something murders per year. The interagency task force was introduced where is a combination of the defense force personnel and the police. That was a special project designed by the police service in conjunction with the Ministry of National Security. It was actually given special funding. Being a part of the technological personnel doing work in the background, what happened in order to create crime suppression? We created 12 geographic patrol zones. And these zones were actually geofence and patrol by patrol personnel with at least two police officers and two soldiers in a vehicle. And in each zone, you had that patrol and they were given particular, particular instructions in how to go about the patrol in each zone. What was identified is by in it, you need to do profiling. So you had the persons who were profiled as the troublemakers or the offenders. You know, you're, you're also targeted the sort of vehicles that they use, the numbers. So they will patrol in these zones and lock down these zones and do the stop and search. And on top of that, you had a, a strike team that will strike into that zone at certain times and do house searches. So suppression is all about that. However, what came and happened is that over a period, the offenders, as you know, are very adaptable. They adapted to the situation. They created different pathways and they used the steps and tracks in Laventille and you still continue getting a lot, you get a lot of the murders from Hollywood to Africa to Sugrim Trace, all the areas up in Laventille. So what was done in order to continue the suppression of the crime, they introduced in each zone two police officers and foot patrol and two soldiers. So other than the mobile patrol, you had four persons doing foot patrol that had locked down the area. And in fact, with that work and other work that I will deal with in the, when I deal with the mediation aspect to give the example, the murders reduced in Laventil and in the Port of Spain area from an average of 110 per year to 66 unknown to persons. I know in recent times, persons have been talking about significant reduction in crime. But during that period of 2006 to 2012 was the highest reduction ever in serious crimes in Trinidad and Tobago. Although there was only a 5% in reduction in violent crime. In fact, serious crimes, serious crime reduced from an average of 22,000 per year to 13,000 per year during that period that I'm talking about. So what happened with that suppression and in relation to the strike team, we were very successful. So I use the Trinidad example. to so say when we talk about suppression, what do we mean? Is arresting persons, charging persons, doing stuff and search. But in between there, you need to gather intelligence information that can add to your database so that you can in, in fact deal with the young situation but existing in the particular area so you can profile persons properly so you can take further action. So that is the proactive part of crime suppression whereby you can gather intelligence information. 
I will now go to Jamaica. Jamaica, in their suppression, I will, before I go to Jamaica, I don't want to mention something about Trinidad. Someone will ask how we had such a mother in, in Love and Till, which was so successful, yet we had crime displacement that spread to the other divisions, like Northern Division that moved from an average of 80 murders per year to 130, 140 per year, also in the Central Division. Certain aspects of crime suppression were attempted in the enterprise area, in the Northern Division, where there are 13 areas that need crime suppression to lock down because of the crime situation. But none of those suppression events were supported financially like the ITF in Port of Spain. In fact, there's a special budget from the Ministry of National Security that provides support for the ITF, supply, su supply support, even for vehicles and other things. So the ITF in itself is a project that is not just funded by the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, but there's special allowance for the IATF in the Port of Spain area. So therefore, in attempting it in other areas, required that form of budgeting and support that over the period never really happened. And if we are going to replicate that approach in other areas that is high crime, it will require the sort of financial support that is required like what is being provided for the ITF at the Port of Spain area, which covers Love and Hill, Beacom and Lodria. In fact, the ITF now provides support in situations that may occur in other divisions, while the mandate is really for the Love and Hill and Beacom Sealux area. So crime load suppression is a mechanism that can be used and can be used in a successful way. And you all have seen the results that occurred in Trinidad. In Jamaica, in 2017, Jamaica reached a high of 1,650 murders per year. What they did in Jamaica, the Prime Minister, Mr. Holness, and his cabinet and government, in fact, introduced these special zones of operation, which is the same geographic areas that they identify, but they went further. While in Trinidad and Tobago, we did not interview, introduce a curfew system in these zones. They introduced curfew where the superintendent of police plus the um, a lieutenant who is in charge from the defense force can come together and make a decision that they can issue a curfew in an area at least for 42 hours with the permission of the Minister of National Security. So therefore, these zones of special operations in Jamaica follow the same mechanism used in Trinidad and Tobago, but add to it the curfew aspect, but is the same mechanism they're using with searches, with stop and search, targeting individuals, having strike teams, keeping the presence, and it suppress crime to a particular level. In fact, for last year, Jamaica had 1,000 498 murders. And what they had to do was to also include additional areas of zones of operations for special operations. Yes, someone may say that they have introduced that in Jamaica and you only get 200 murders less, but 200 lives means a lot. Therefore, to have suppression to be used in Trinidad and Tobago, where crime now have spread throughout 
the nine police divisions. A decision needs to be made which divisions they can, in fact, introduce the ITF approach with the special zones of interest approach to lockdown areas. Yes, there are human rights issues that come up, the rights of individuals come up. Yes, it will be inconvenience to the residents, but at the end of the day, everyone feels satisfied when the violent crime level is reduced in an area and persons can feel much safer. Without the necessary financial support, it will be basically impossible for the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And also without the real support of the Defense Force to achieve the same sort of suppression they have achieved in Lavantel, Vitam, and other areas with the manpower and resources that the police service has at this point in time. In spite of the various task forces, CID and others, we realize that the crime situation is such in order to be successful with crime suppression in these various areas. But on the other side of it, and this is where I'm going to introduce the whole aspect of mediation. Uh, and I will go. If I may interject, if I may interject, Mr. Um, Jacob. Yes, uh, I am predisposed to give uh, one more minute. Yeah, okay, no problem. Give no um, tight time scheduling. Okay. Proceed. Right. No, the, the mediation is a form of that can be used hand in hand and everybody will know that we have the Hearts and Minds program, but in that you had the Interrupters program where persons were trained as interrupters with a project called Project Reason working hand in hand while they do the suppression. So the suppression and the mediation with persons with conflict skills need to work hand in hand while you do the work and added to that with Hal, with, with Hal Graves and others, who were the interrupters, did significant work and were very successful in assisting in mediating between gangs and other rivalry to reduce and help reduce the crime situation and help with the suppression that was taking place. So suppression will include both conflict resolution being done, will be done, and also the hardcore policing that is required. So both work hand in hand, and I can see why, why the decision was made to look at crime oppression and mediation together, because both need to work hand in hand in order to help with any criminogenic environment to create crime reduction in Trinidad and Tobago or any other place in the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Very much, Mr. Jacob. Uh, we go directly now to the questions. Uh, the first one, Mr. Jacob, um, has to do with, do you think there are too many sections in the police service whose duties overlap? And do you think amalgamating some of these sections can bring about an increase in manpower that can add to the crime fighting initiative? Well, the, the question is taken, and that is so true that we moved away from division oriented and station oriented to specialization to the point that we have too many specialized areas. And that is the reason why the police service within the last few years has established CIB. Right, the Central Intelligence Bureau, where you have a, a commingling of, in fact, a lot of the intelligence right, units falling under one head, so it will help with the whole aspect of manpower. There's a lot of other work that needs to be done in relation to that aspect, cutting down the number of sections. But remember, as we go hand in hand, we will see as we progress that long ago we didn't have cyber issues. We didn't have several other issues. We didn't have CCTV issues. We didn't have all these things to deal with. However, there was a mother that I identified that is being used 
in, in the UK. When I visited the UK and at the Metropolitan Police Department and what they are doing where the criminal investigation department is now contemporary criminal investigation, meaning to say that a lot of the activities that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service may have are separate units and now commingled into the CID and the criminal investigators are trained differently. So yes, I am in agreement that will need to be done to go in that direction so that you can get more boots and ground out there by doing some sort of commingling of the various um, units. Okay. Uh, given your wealth of professional experience, Mr. Jacob, when do we decide that an initiative is not working and we need to go back to the drawing board to go to plan B? Well, well, the first thing is, is that anytime you come with an initiative, you're supposed to come up with, 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 with um, proper research methods and how you're doing the evaluation, monitoring evaluation. What has happened, we tend to ignore our learning at the university in relation to doing projects and setting targets and how we will monitor and achieve it. So therefore, by the time we come up with a project, there should be the measurements set in how it can be measured. And it should be done in a rigid way. Yes, yes, the police service use the ComStat model right now in order to do the measurements and call person start count but you still need the hardcore research methods to be done. So it's only when that is, and you measure properly, then you will know that whether or not a project is really successful by certain targets and whether or not it's achieving the targets that you can achieve. However, I just wish to mention, like how I talk about the interrupters program, which, which was stopped for a number of years, and I see they started back with six persons, what were they called building blocks or something. One of the reasons why that interrupter program was um, what we call project reason, they got rid of it, is because they could not measure the success of it. Because you're dealing with that, it is depending on qualitative data than quantitative. And we are more inclined with quantitative data and measuring in that way. So therefore, the ministry had stopped that project reason because it wasn't measured. It could not measure the success. But we must come up with mechanisms when we are putting in projects that we can measure it and know, well, look, we are not getting the outcome. So therefore, we can now make the necessary change. So if this is monitored and evaluated properly, we will know at that stage by using our scientific methods that there is no need to continue with it, but we will need to make the necessary changes. Okay. Uh, the other question before us here to place at your attention for analysis, Mr. Jacob, is how is it that we continue to apply techniques used over 10 years ago to suppress crime in these same zones without any progression. While the mechanism would have been successful to that specific period, criminal behavior has somewhat evolved differently. And, and, that, is, and that is so true. And um, again, I don't know what, the same thing we talk on about analysis. I don't know what analysis or research the person who posed the question did to conclude, to come to that conclusion, All right? However, over the period of time, the work that was done by the ITF actually evolved significantly in relation to including the whole aspect of cyber, telephone intercept, Right, I talk about geofencing. A lot of other mechanisms was introduced in order to deal with the changes that were taking place on the landscape. How they do surveillance, how they monitor persons, 
So there were new things introduced. And as I said, if you can reduce murders from 110 to 66, you know, um, yeah, well, you know, you have to continue doing the work. But what we had is that you had, um, some people use the word migration, I use the word displacement occurring and it affected other divisions and some of the same mechanism was not put in place. But I agree that we need to be agile. We need to adapt just like all the criminals adapt to when things are taking place so that the, the police service and the law enforcement can make change. We'll be aware that some of the exchanges is not sometimes the police service alone. The police service sometimes can make the recommendations, but there might be financial, financial implications. So therefore, the product needs to be sold and get the necessary support from the relevant authorities. So again, um, I agree that at times the police service and myself, in, uh, from, from my experience, something have been a bit slow in responding the way they should respond to the change of the landscape. But they have been changing and they have been getting successes in relation to the change. Okay, uh, Mr. McDonald, Jacob, uh, I just want to immediately state, uh, well, we go back a long way, um, and I just want to note that you remain your cool, calm, analytically mature, and highly um, productive self. And I have, I can clearly say that the rigors of holding the post in a period which um, was anything but calm, you have maintained your calm self. So I want to underscore that observation, and I trust that uh, you will continue to be the kind of um, contributor to our societal development here in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, thanks very much. So um, with that in mind, and in keeping with the direction of our program, we now move on to yet another salient and critical juncture in a series, sorry, in an exercise of this nature. And with that in mind, I want to, on behalf of the contents of the program, focus on the impact of crime on the working class population. And when you have, when you have an area like that to explore, it becomes incumbent upon the program uh, team to identify the ideal person to address such an analytically based and highly, it can become very highly uh, instructive. And with that in mind, it is a pleasure for me to call on Mr. Ian Daniel, who is the program dean for the Department of Labor Studies. Uh, Mr. Daniel holds not just a bachelor's, but also a master's of science in sociology. He has lectured in critical areas like critical disciplines, like industrial relations, politics, labor history, sociology and psychology, and he is actively involved in the design and facilitation of specialized and customized training interventions in industrial relations practice. He's indeed also a two-time appointee to the recognition, to the registration, recognition, and certification board of Trinidad and Tobago as an independent member alternate. And for anyone who would have encountered Mr. Daniel will declare he always carries with him that persona of calmness, that persona of analytical precisionism, and above all, someone willing to share his experience and his knowledge with the society. So without any further ado, I call on Mr. Daniel to address us 
on the impact of crime on the working class population. Mr. Daniel. Thank you very much, Dennis, for that <clears throat> introduction. Um, I will try to live up <laughs> to the billing. Uh, let me try to share my screen um, with you. Uh, and get my presentation going. Um, are you up? Are we up, Dennis? All right. So we're looking at the impact of crime on the working class. And basically, I want to start by saying that every part of crime, every single part of the issue of crime affects the working class. And what we want to look through today is to look at different elements of crime. I want to start by looking at the scale of crime, some of which has been um, introduced by our other presenters already. We want to look at um, who commits crime. We want to look at elements of the response of crime. And I want to give a small note on some of the solutions um, that we can look at for um, resolving the crime situation that we're in. Well, one of the things that we have to recognize is that we are in a bit of a situation here. Um, I think that the, we're all aware of uh, the records in Trinidad and Tobago being set, especially with the murder rates last year and the, the clip that we're at um, this year already. Um, if you look at the top 10 countries with the highest murder rate um, uh, measured by a uh, ratio to 100, every 100,000 people in the population, um, you'll see that Trinidad and Tobago is actually quite high. We're not in the top 10, but several of our Caribbean um, neighbors and South American neighbors are. The number 10 is South Africa, 35.7 for 100,000. Trinidad and Tobago, when this was done in 2017, was at 30.65. So we're not quite um, you know, far from the situation. And what's interesting is that the United Nations considers it to be a literal murder epidemic if you have more than 10 per 100,000. We have three, um, three times that level to be considered uh, an epidemic. Uh, we're outside the top 10 in relation to murders, but when you take crime overall, we're actually in the top 10, we're number six. So we're not doing very well there at all. And then in relation to corruption, um, the Global Corruption Index by Global Risk Profile has us at number 71, which is just a little above halfway um, in a, a survey of 190 um, countries. So we're not worst off in relation to corruption, we're nowhere near best either. And as you see, we jumbled right around a number of other Caribbean um, countries, St. Vincent, Barbados, Jamaica. Um, so the, the crime profile um, for the Caribbean is not a good one. The crime profile for Trinidad and Tobago is not a good one at all. So let's ask the question, um, who's committing crimes? Uh, basically, as a sociological rule of thumb, what one sees is that um, the working class commits violent crimes, crimes against um, property. The middle class tends to commit fraud and tax evasion. The upper class tends to commit higher levels of tax evasion, um, higher levels of fraud. So there's a there's literally a correlation between um, what class you belong to and what type of crime uh, members of your class commit. So we have this high level of, of crime in our society and indeed throughout the world. One of the things that you're seeing is that they, you must have 
um, and correctly so, a response to the level of crime. Unfortunately, we tend to zero in on the spectacular crime, the violent crimes, the crimes against poverty. And what that does is that it leads to a militarization of the police in response to the type of crime that captures the attention. And so gone are the fifth helmets and the, the gray shirt, the short pants, tall socks, and the battle. Now our police look more like soldiers. Our soldiers um, blend right into the police. Um, we are looking at scenes of, of, of um, urban warfare. And it, it li literally becomes uh, those scenes of urban warfare along the East-West Corridor um, in Trinidad and Tobago and in the other so-called hotspots of Trinidad and Tobago as we respond to those areas of crime concentration. Again, I want to make sure that I, I, I'm clear. There is no way that you can ignore the, the levels of crime, but this does tend to occur, this militarization. And the unfortunate impact of that is that you start seeing things like this all over the world. Um, I remember being moved to tears looking at Eric Garner suffocate. By the time it came around um, last year to the trial um, in Minneapolis, I had no tears for George Floyd. Um, and unfortunately, it, it, it is disturbing when you hear representatives of um, the, the, the state, representatives of the police force speak about the facing crime in in video game terms that that really should be should not be a part of uh, in my opinion policing so let's look a bit at the reaction to crime and the, the crime situation i want to look at incarceration as one of our of one of our speakers was um, referring to earlier, um, we have high levels of incarceration. Actually, we are our our Caribbean levels of incarceration almost challenge that of the United States, which incarcerates a really ridiculous level of it, its population. We are within the the in the Caribbean the top ten of incarcerated societies in the world. Um, and if you look at the international average of 145 inmates per 100,000, you look at Trinidad and Tobago, you see that we are well above that. We're nearly twice that level. Interestingly enough, Jamaica, in, a, in this um, World Prison Brief survey, is actually one of the few Caribbean countries that is beneath the international average. Um, and that was in 2018. So. Uh, our response to crime leads to a very high level of incarceration. Um, and of course, we just heard that we have an a, a, a incredibly high level of recidivism as well, over 60% throughout the Caribbean region. What that leads one to conclude is that our level of incarceration is not really putting a dent in the levels of crime. Um, who are the incarcerated? If we take, we can take a couple of indicators um, to look at who is incarcerated. Um, the first one is education. When you look at education, you see throughout the region in these um, countries that are surveyed, that the majority of, of the incarcerated have not completed secondary school. And so what you're looking at is um, people who have very little prospects for employment. One might say that many of them are unemployable. If you look at, um, this was an interesting uh, uh, question, looking at the state of employment of the person incarcerated just before they were incarcerated as compared to the society. What you see is that the person who is incarcerated um, almost throughout the entirety of the, the survey, um, experienced a higher level of unemployment than the national average. If you look at Trinidad and Tobago, the person who is incarcerated um, experienced a 23%, which is an extremely high level of, of unemployment. 
compared to the national level of 3%. So it tells you that the people who are being incarcerated for crime are the working class, which is a fairly disturbing idea in itself. But as we said, we're looking at the impact of crime on the working class. Um, nothing says that we're looking at the impact on the working class as victims. That being said, who are the victims of crime? People victimize another general rule of um, term in sociology. People victimize people who are like themselves. For the poor people um, who are engaged in crime generally don't go out of their environments to, to participate in crime. So the people that they, they victimize are members of their own neighborhood, of their own communities, people of their own class. And what that means is that working people, poor people, tend to be largely the victims of violent crime, the victims of crime against, or, or, or against property um, at a much higher rate than the middle class or um, the upper class. They face crimes that involve violence at a much higher rate than any other group. Well, right. Um, and as I said, if, you are, if we are saying that we incarcerate at a, an extremely high level in the region, but then we say that our crime rates are extremely high and are rising, and we are in this discussion because of the disturbing rise of, of crime, then we have to admit that imprisonment has a low deterrent effect. It doesn't dent the availability of guns or drugs. It doesn't stop people from becoming members of gangs. It doesn't stop recidivism. So we, if we use the, the standard uh, mechanisms of, of crime prevention, we're really in a hole uh, in terms of preventing crime. Um, so some of the, the discussion that, that preceded were, would be of, of great importance in looking at that, that issue. Let us look at the relationship between class, wealth, and crime. Let's take a, a more elevated view of it and look at the entirety of, of, of our societies. When you look at societies, um, research shows, World Bank research, research from different sociologists will show that crime rates and inequality are positively correlated, both within and between societies. What does that mean? It means the higher the level of inequality, the higher the level of poverty within a society, the higher the level of crime tends to be within that society. It's not a causal relationship. There are lots of intervening factors. It's a very complex situation. It has to be treated as that, but this part of it is irrefutable. The higher your levels of poverty, the higher your levels of inequality, the higher your levels of crime in, uh, crime in your society. And one of the disturbing things is that for the last two decades, inequality has been growing worldwide. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the economist Gary Becker, who died not too long ago, who is a member of the Chicago School and who, is a, a, who was um, a, 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 an authority on social capital, he points out that poverty of alleviation will reduce crime in our society. One of the things that Professor Gerard Hutchinson um, pointed out, and Professor Gerard Hutchinson was actually, at the time in 2012, um, the head of medical sciences uh, in um, UWE, he looked at crime as a public health issue. And he points out that you don't just have the issue of crime that occurs the fear of crime also becomes a factor in and of itself, and that that factor has the ability to erode society, erode the very fabric of society. And he looked at, very, uh, at a few things that contributed to this social erosion. The media and the way it portrays crime has a tendency to, to um, make crime, well, 
spectacular, to be, be with sensational, but also to caricature crime, to make it feel somewhat unreal. And that diminishes both the impact of human suffering on the people who look at it, it diminishes your ability to feel compassion when you look at crime, uh, which is a thing that always amazes me because of the way that criminal acts just run across social media without any kind of restraint as entertainment. Um, one of the other things that he points out, quoting Jonathan Simon, is that the response to crime, the political response to crime amounts to crime control as a basis for, as you see on the screen, executive power. Pol politicians, if you want to stay in power, must respond to crime. And that response to crime, it has to be strong, tends to be militaristic. And you know, uh, kind of Mr. Daniel, if I may quietly interject, uh, mm -hmm. I have the authority to give you one more minute. Um, so if you please proceed. Thank you very much, Dennis, for taking a minute to give me a minute. Um, <laughs> Yes, and one of the things that, that the professor pointed out as well is that the, the cycle of crime creates a pervasive distrust of institutions. So we don't believe in our institutions to be able to control the situation, to be able to give us um, a sense of security. And then that tied into our social values of consumption and materialism, produces a loss of community. It produces a rise of individualism. It produces a sense of social competition that actually normalizes criminal activity. It causes people to engage in acts of criminal activity to allow them to engage in acts of consumption. And remember what we were saying as well is that people feel no, no sense of connectedness to others. So, hey, it, it's not a problem. It's less of a problem. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that the, the high level of crime distorts, and this is going to affect the working class, it distorts the allocation of public resources, both in the private sector and in the public sector, which then limits um, the ability of the society to respond to issues, different kinds of issues, health issues, social security issues um, for the working class as you have to prioritize um, violence in the society. And finally, what's the way forward? Well, the way forward has to be a whole society approach. We can't look at crime alone and attempt to, to, to deal with crime in isolation. We have to stop using GNP and GDP as a country's measure for success. Um, look at the top 10 countries in the world to live in. Why do people like those countries? What is it about the social fabric? What is it about the freedom in those societies, about support and connection in those societies that make them good places to live? Um, we have to look at balancing the, the, the prosecution of white collar crime and violent crime. White collar crime is rising in terms of its value, and yet the focus on white collar crime is actually diminishing over the last two decades. We have to balance suppression with poverty alleviation. We have to look at diversification for creating opportunity and therefore alleviating poverty. We have to bridge the gap between the police and the community because without that partnership between police and community, the ability of the criminals to run through society will continue unabated. We have to focus on marginalized societies with removing that push towards criminal activity. And then we have to recreate the level of community that used to exist and reduce that individualism that pushes the person that, that sees all kinds of, of criminal activity from corruption to road rage, um, becoming continuing to be the norm in society. So um, with that, you know, we must get to the point where uh, uh, 
the, the attractiveness of crime and the ease of crime is, is, is less available and that the, the communal aspects of our, of our existence, the social aspects of our existence is able to put some self-discipline um, on our society once again. Dennis, over to you. Mr. Daniel, uh, on my list here, um, the first question, uh, Mr. Daniel, that um, is, uh, to use the term thrown at you, is the conflict theory suggests that inequality is mainly responsible for violent crimes, and the reaction from the state is to incarcerate rather than create opportunity. How true is this statement? Um, well, I think that we've been looking at the figures uh, across different um, presenters here today that shows that we can incarcerate till thy kingdom come. It doesn't oh, stop Mr. Crime. Mr. Daniel, Mr. Daniel, just one quick request. If you can stop your presentation, and that is for, oh, you know, the yes, IT. Sorry about yeah. that. Yes, proceed. My apologies. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So as I was saying, um, you can, we can incarcerate as many as we want. It does not seem to have the impact of stopping crime. No, it. That's not to say don't incarcerate. You you can't have violent criminals running around doing as they will. There is a place for suppression. But we, at the same time, we have to prevent the supply of new criminals. And it seems that um, without attempting a one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship, a one-to-one -one relationship, it seems that the only thing that has a long-term impact on producing um, crime is, well, the alleviation of poverty is less, um, less uh, uh, inequality in society. You know, that in itself is a complex thing. It's not a simple thing to achieve that, but we can't just be throwing police at the, at the issue. There are long-term structural solutions that are required as well, and they, they won't be found within the walls of a prison. Okay, the other question um, emanating from the audience, Mr. Daniel, is I believe that crime control escalates in our education system. However, teachers are not psychologically equipped to deal with such development. Mm -hmm. How would you view this? What would you recommend? Well, well, as I suggested, this is a whole society problem that will have whole society um, requirements. Teachers aren't sufficient. Prison officers aren't sufficient. Police officers aren't sufficient. You know. Um, we're going to need all hands on deck. We need parents to, 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 to rise to the challenge. Um, we need um, religion to rise to the, to, to the challenge, you know. So you need community to, you need to rebuild community um, so that, you know, our children grow up um, protected and, and with, with values. We need to engage in sport. In, in a very structured way to give people alternative activities than the one that leads down those, those roads. But we still have to ensure that people are able to live in our society, um, people are able to get jobs in our societies and prevent the, the need or the attractiveness of this alternative kind of economic system and lifestyle pulling them into, into criminal activity. We have to look at both the push and pull effects, but it's definitely not on the shoulders of teachers or police. And at some point in time, the community has to stand up for itself as well. Okay. Once again, uh, it's always a pleasure for me to, um, if not introduce or to be a part of the listening audience um, with respect to contributions delivered by Mr. Daniel. I want to express my deep appreciation for the wide ranging coverage that you would have undertaken and presented here for us today.
uh, the final area of focus, which we move to, has to do with the whole question of the role of the cooperative sector in reducing crime. And emanating from this exploration, I want to call on Mr. Colin Bartholomew, who is the program dean of the Department of Cooperative Studies. Mr. Bartholomew, who has been actively involved in the cooperative movement for over 25 years, leads the cooperative department, and he holds a BSc in economics and human resource management, as well as an MBA with innovation and entrepreneurship specialization. He is a certified trainer with the International Labor Organization. Um, but you know, there is that Start and Improve Your Business program, and Mr. Bartholomew is functionally and effectively involved in a program of that nature. I now take the pleasure of respectfully requesting Mr. Bartholomew to address us. Uh, Mr. Bartholomew. Um, Thank you so yours. much. Thank you so much, Dennis, and good afternoon to everyone online, or the listening and viewing audience, and to my fellow panelists. I thoroughly enjoy the, the presentations really leading up to, to my presentation. So, you know, I, I don't know if it's a um, case of saving the best for last or that, you know, you have, <laughs> you, you have positioned me, you understand, as the closing batsman. So I, I really want to thank um, the organizers for this opportunity. And once again, it's another opportunity to put put the spotlight on the cooperative sector. Now, the cooperative sector is one that exists in each and every society. It is a sector that is established globally. However, what we have observed as a cooperative practitioner, myself, is that it usually just flies below the radar in terms of prominence in, in most societies. And it's really based on what is referred to as the, the lack of the promotion of the cooperative identity. So it's important that as we get into this, we, we position some context and what we will do is also take a look at the cooperative business model and that cooperative model as one which addresses the issue, the, the criminogenic society and how it is well positioned really to make a difference. Um, all the presenters thus far have really touched on some, some very salient um, issues from, you know, from the incarceration funneling right through to the presentation by Mr. Daniel in terms of, of crime and the impact of the crime on the working people. So as we get into the cooperative business model and, and the response of the cooperative sector to reducing crime, I always find it instructive to begin with a definition. And, you know, it, this is something that exists for the world in terms of the cooperative being an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprises. And to me, why that is always important is that it highlights that a cooperative, in its sense, is really a tree-headed, <laughs> a giant, a tree-headed giant, looking at one being an autonomous association of people really by themselves. But then it addresses not only the economic needs, but the, the social and the cultural needs. And then it speaks to the type of enterprise that democratically controlled and jointly owned enterprise and enterprises. So it's, it's very, very instructive when it comes to what is really a cooperative. And you know, a lot of people say, well, where cooperatives exist and cooperatives exist all around us. The most familiar type, 
you will hear about this credit unions. In Africa, they are known as SACOs or savings and credit cooperatives. And there are other types of cooperatives existing all around us. Even, I, I mean, internationally, we're talking about the Barcelona Football Club. We're talking about um, Florida, Orange Juice. And locally, you're even talking about the St. Christopher's gas station and, and the breakfast shed. So the cooperative is a business model that exists around us and it helps to bolster. And when you, you do the investigation into to how it came about, it's very instructive and it's not by any means something to be taken lightly. It's something large. And here we look at the, the cooperative economy around the world and you can see it's really a robust sector. So this is the cooperative economy and turnover by sector. And you can see it's really a billion dollar sector when you add it up around the world. And it exists in a number of sectors, bringing about solutions to issues. Remember, it's really about being meeting the cultural, economic, and social needs. Now, um, traditionally, people spoke to the cooperative movement in the, the social economy, but the social economy, what we have found isn't enough. It doesn't capture the true element and all the facets of the cooperative movement. What has been the discourse of late is what you call the solidarity economy. And that solidarity economy really addresses and captures the elements of the sustainable development goals. All right, so those sustainable development goals, cooperatives have been inserted to address those things. And this, just allow me to build the foundation, especially as it addresses what, what we, 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 we're looking at the criminogenic society. And Mr. Daniel, in his presentation, touched on poverty, that number one sustainable development goal, no poverty, that actually being a, a, a critical part of the, the crime problem and what exists in a criminogenic society, especially impacting working people. So cooperatives have really been responding to that. And in particular, cooperatives look at, at really addressing on one hand, the issue of employment. What cooperatives have been able to do as a business model is to organize economically, socially, and culturally, and bring this autonomous group of people together. And in so doing, provide a platform where employment can be generated. As the other presenters have issued, when persons are gainfully employed, you, you tend less towards criminal activity and endeavor. So, he, corporate enterprises really employ people directly, right? And indirectly, they promote employment and self-employment through creating marketing opportunity. And then there's also a spillover effect to non-members whose professional activities are also related to the transactions with the cooperative. So it's directly, indirectly, and there are also spillover activities when it comes to generating employment. Now, this is one of the ways and locally, well, I should say in, in the Caribbean, this is the data which exists. And this is from the, the, the Global Census on Cooperatives um, dated back in 2017, where you have over 54,000 persons actually being gainfully employed through the over 1,000 cooperatives in the Caribbean. And uh, I, I, will, I will not, um, I will not <laughs> you know, generate the, the, or, or poke at the anger of Mr. Daniel, where he says, you know, the, we have to stop looking at, at, you know, gross revenues and, and such as measures. Of, of the impact, but what I will say is that cooperatives continue to make a contribution 
throughout the Caribbean in a very tangible way. So it's very important. So it, it is a significant contributor. So in so doing, in addressing the areas of unemployment, it also, by spillover, also addresses and, and, and tends towards making things less, less crime attractive and, yes, I just want to get this. Yes, so, I mean, we had a holistic view and this was really the individual look at societies, the Barbados, the Dominica, Jamaica, SVG, and Trinidad, and Tobago. And you would see the, the, the kind of employment being generated, but what is also instructive here is that there are a significant number of user members, that column to the extreme right, user members, people actually being engaged by the, the cooperative. And remember, the cooperative in itself addresses economic, social, and cultural needs. So a user member, person using your cooperative and also belonging to the cooperative, it, it, it addresses your needs economically, socially, and culturally because you are brought into a space where people have common needs. But then the cooperative also touches on the informal economy. And that informal economy is what is not officially captured. It is, it, 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 it is not really one that is registered. And the information and activity largely goes unaddressed and unrecorded. So, the informal economy in developing countries like us tend to sometimes exceed the formal economy, sometimes being as much as 50, greater than 50% of the economy. And this is the observation of the International Labour Organization. So where do cooperatives that they insert themselves? Remember, in the informal economy, in that, in that unrecorded economy, there's the opportunity for activity to go unrecorded and to tend towards criminal behavior. So therefore, there is a, a very important role when it comes to the cooperatives in addressing that. So poverty and the informal economy, as we addressed, are linked. So persons who find themselves in poverty will do almost anything to ensure they are able to provide for their families, they are caught in what is known as the poverty cycle, where they will do almost anything. And that almost anything also speaks to desperation. So there's an observation that this is an occurrence. So cooperatives also insert themselves at that point in time when it comes to the informal economy, but poverty in particular, poverty in particular really is dressed through the model. Right, so direct and indirect employment, as alluded to earlier, created by cooperatives, creates a consistent income for persons, which in turn contributes to improving standards of living and importantly, reducing poverty. So these are the observations taken from the empirical data as to the insertion of cooperatives in any society and any economy. But when it comes to that, the, the, the study by, by Delvertier et al. in 2017, in particular, looked at cooperatives and poverty, really, really attaching to three key issues. First of all, it provided security to the poor by allowing them to convert individual risks to collective risks. So persons will no longer face risk by themselves, but as a collective and were able to address it in a sustainable and tangible way. Further to that, it empowered the disadvantaged really to defend their interests. And in so doing, there was that sense of fulfillment and really emboldenment to move towards more productive activity. And, they, and also, cooperatives being inserted as a, a panacea for poverty 
really mediated member access to assets that they utilize to earn a living. So before, individually, persons may not have been able really to, to get access, but through the cooperative structure and the business model, they were able to, to mediate member access to utilize and to earn a living. So therefore, we want to talk about this cooperative solution, right? Especially in terms of the crime reduction. So I would like to proffer, so, you know, just uh, certain hypotheses and uh, in so doing, it's really coming out of the study done by the International Cooperative Alliance as to how it can be addressed in a sustainable and tangible manner. So some cooperative interventions really around the area of capital, community, credit, support, and peace. Now remember, this is being tied now to the sustainable development goals. So as far as capital goes, what the cooperative actually does and what, what they, we, they have found, the research has found is that persons who find themselves limited to accessing positive social capital would tend to be involved in miscreant behavior. So the cooperative now, because it's a collective, it, it really amalgamates even risks. It provides a source of positive social capital. But then also, community, and this is one that will be developed, a strong sense of community participation, empowerment, and inclusion is really achieved through the intervention of cooperatives. Of course, it is also an economic, a business model, so access to credit is obtained. And then there is also the softer side because it's about it's about the economic, social, and cultural. So providing emotional support for members, those persons who have been touched, who have been affected by crime and criminality can also come as a collective and get the required support. And what is, well, the cooperative also has the ability to reestablish equilibrium. Mr. Brown, you're coming to the mic. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? So it restores interpersonal, relationships and peace. But I, I must touch on this. So uh, as far as the community goes, what the cooperative really has the opportunity to do is to mobilize those community assets. Utilize the community assets to empower members. So persons feel empowered. So there, there's no need for criminal activity to feel empowered. Also, harnessing the community partnerships for sustainable enterprises. Thirdly, establishing a framework for the delivery of social protection programs. The cooperative model offers that and also creates an environment for inclusion. All are welcome because by its very nature, its philosophical underpinnings, persons are really the bolstered and creating um, a, a model for inclusion. And just, just this last example as we close, this is an example from Nairo Ruby, which always captured my attention. For reform the criminals, persons who, um, they, they were reformed criminals, they were involved in criminal activities in Nairobi, Kenya, and, and eventually they, they saw there was opportunity to get out of criminality by coming together, pooling the resources, and they got into bike into these motorbikes. Now they provided both, not only transport, but they also provided security because they reformed criminals and persons were less likely to engage with them. So the, the example of coming together in the cooperative business model has been effectively utilized, you know, as a measure and a means to reduce crime. So with that note, I would like to say thank you very much and thank you each and everyone back over to you dennis okay thanks for that very extensive input we are indeed um uh, 
we are indeed gifted with the levels of information to be exposed to all that information, Mr. Bartholomew. So let me go immediately to the questions as outlined by our listening or viewing audience. The first one goes like this. As explained by Mr. Bartholomew, as much as 54,000 plus job opportunities created globally, which is very applauding. What avenues have been created or put in place to make these job opportunities more accessible mm -hmm. for the undereducated and the underemployed? Yeah, definitely, and, and thanks for that. And you know, um, the cooperative um, business model by its very philosophical underpinnings really is about people development. So it, it is not engaged in a structure where, where qualification or profit comes first. It's really a people-based and focused business. So um, in, in the job creation, while you would see such robust jobs being created, it is a, a, a center where persons can be engaged, can be trained, and can be developed to serve in the cooperative. Um, by so doing, um, in order to, to work around the, the formalities, cooperative by its very nature is a volunteer-based business. So you have the opportunity to begin voluntarily and work your way into the throes of, of the capital and, um, and being salaried and receiving a, a wage. So that is how access is really provided through that avenue of volunteerism in order to, to get through, to, to serve and to work at your cooperative. Okay, um, the yes. other question, Mr. Bartholomew is, I have not seen or heard any, I have not seen or heard of any financial institution or financial system set up to aid the poor man whose hmm. debt service ratio prevents him or her from accessing financing of some sort to cover their basic needs. Yeah. And Mr. Bartholomew shed some light on this. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's it's something very interesting. Um, the, uh, there is a move towards what is now being called cooperative capitalism, where you, you are moving away from the traditional structure of um the of a capitalistic society which which considers all those uh, measures you know speak about high debt service and ratio, um, uh, lack of securitization and these sorts of things to to get into you know uh, this cooperative capitalization and one of the the most important um, um, developments coming out of it is what what they call sweat equity right where you can contribute something equivalent to hardcore capital and security in order to to contribute to the organization so there there is opportunity and scope within the cooperative sector and the cooperative business model to be able to do this what um what however is required is um further education of the masses to move in that direction and some innovation when it comes to the product offerings to be able to move in that direction. So, so indeed it is it is a concern. It is not something, you know, on the front burner, it is not a foreigner, but it is a possibility. And it is being practiced in some parts of the world under the cooperative model. Okay, uh, let me, Sincerely, I thank you, Mr. Bartholomew, for enriching us with uh, those critical analytical pieces of information. Uh, what we can say coming out from this webinar is that we have been served a very decisive and a very palatable menu for which we are indeed grateful. And I want to just add that this is the first of out of three webinars 
that the Security Administration and Emergency Management Department will be conducting. So we, as uh, an institution, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, we continue to put our best foot forward in meeting our vision and our mission objective by engaging meaningfully in this kind of corporate social responsibility. Without any further ado, on my own behalf, I would sincerely like to offer my gratitude to those presenters and again apologize for the late start. And I am indeed honored to introduce the program dean of the Security Administration and Emergency Management um, Department, Ms. Adriana Archer, um, to bring some closing remarks to today's exercise. Ms. Archer. Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> and it is indeed my esteemed pleasure to bring closing remarks to this webinar that focuses on achieving crime reduction in a heightened crime, criminogenic environment, looking you know, specifically at crime causality, crime reduction, and crime suppression. <clears throat> so I would first like to thank you know, our director of the college, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry, for giving us this platform to have a perspective on this very burning issue of crime and to be able to share with you through our presenters, what are some of the causes of crime, how crime can be reduced and suppressed. So thank you, Dr. Henry, for your opening remarks. It was well received. Thank you to Dr. Wallace for taking time from your very busy schedule to be with us this afternoon to share your perspective on the challenges facing rehabilitation in our nation's prisons. Thank you for reminding us that people go to prison as punishment, not for punishment. And the main goal, the main goal is rehabilitation as you would have pointed out and according to you it is the means that may be used to achieve the intended end so this use of your the interventions you know that are used to correct according to you it is also a process and an outcome it just does not happen overnight. So we could also extend thanks to the prison services for their rehabilitation programs that they would have instituted. Noting that there are indeed challenges and that these challenges, they must be dealt with. So thank you again, Dr. Wallace, for your, your time and for your, your presentation that you would have shared with us this afternoon. Also much thanks goes out to the former acting commissioner of police, Mr. McDonald Jacob, for opening our hearts and minds really to what is crime suppression and seeking to some extent, yes, we could use mediation as one of the tools that could assist in reducing crimes you know, whereby families, our neighbors, our husbands and wives could work through their problems, there would definitely be a reduction in crime and criminal activities. So, Mr. Jacob, thank you for sharing with us what, you know, you interpret as crime suppression. Thank you again for using as the example our own interagency task force. Thank you for bringing knowledge to us with respect to what actually took place, not only here in Trinidad and Tobago, but also, you know, you extended it to, um, 
to Jamaica. Thank you for using your, your knowledge as a former commissioner of police to enlighten us on crime and you know what actually takes place in this criminogenic environment here in Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, and I thank you again for sharing with us that we know that mediation can be used hand in hand. And you would have mentioned the Hearts and Minds project, the interrupters projects and so forth, which all played very important roles in our society in assisting in the reduction and the suppressing of crime. To my esteemed colleague, Mr. Ian Daniel, the program dean for Labor Studies Department, always a pleasure to have you to share your thoughts as it pertains to the working class. Today, you would have shared with us the impact of crime on the working class, where, according to you, every single part of the issues of crime affects the working class, and this is so true. You would have distinguished between blue collar crimes and white collar crimes, and who commits these crimes in our society. Again, those traumatized by crime basically comes from the working class. You also mentioned where crime is a public health issue. And there's also that cycle of crime, poverty. You know, to get out of that, that, that cycle, it could be at times very, very, very difficult. You also spoke to the rise of individualism, among other things, you know, where crime you know, actually becomes normalized. And the whole, you know, the whole intervention with respect to community police. And this is a model that we all should actually move towards, you know, where the, um, the police or law enforcement could be seen actually inter interacting with the same people that you would have spoken about. So thank you again, Mr. Daniel, for your, for your, discourse and it was indeed greatly appreciated. Last but certainly not least, according to Mr. Bartholomew, he might be might be just saving the best for last. Thank you, Mr. Bartholomew, for enlightening, for your enlightening discourse on the role that the cooperative sector should be play, playing in reducing crime. You would have shared with us your cooperative or the cooperative business model, sharing what is a cooperative and its importance to society, more so the employment of persons, thereby making crime less attractive to individuals. Yes, poverty is always included in that because we know that it is mostly the, the, I don't want to say downtrodden, but those who are less fortunate in society would be the ones who would gravitate towards this cooperative business model, as you would have pointed out with your, your example. So again, we want to say thank you for sharing with us this cooperative business model and to let you know that it was well received. So to conclude, again, I just want to say an overall thank you to Dr. Wendell Wallace, Mr. McDonald Jacob, Mr. Ian Daniel, and Mr. Colin Bartholomew for sharing your knowledge with us here this afternoon. Also, not forgetting, my dear friend, Mr. Dennis Brown, our moderator, who I must add is the, the, the one who actually had this idea with respect to this webinar. So I want to place this webinar squarely in his laps because this is a, 
this is actually his webinar. Um, the topics, everything came from him. And I just, as the program dean, did what I had to do in making it, bringing it to full fruition. So Mr. Brown, thank you very much for all that you would have done. Thank you too. Special thanks too to the IT team, our IT team, Elma Francois Institution, Marketing Department, and all who would have participated in this, in this webinar. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for those questions that were asked. And uh, as Mr. Brown would have um, mentioned, this is only the first in a series of other, of other webinars to follow. So the Security Administration and Emergency Management Department would like to thank you all. And we look forward to you participating in our webinar series. Thank you very much.